So good morning, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another exciting Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants broadcast. My name is Jesse. For many of you, it's your first time joining us, in which case, welcome to Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. We are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. We've got 30 plus broadcasts in September alone on everything from cave diving to volcanology to hurricane hunting and more. It's an incredible kickoff of the school year and a big thank you to all you students and teachers for joining us with such cool people. Now this is my second of three straight broadcasts today. We just wrapped up with cave lemurs in Madagascar. Right after this we've got Bringing Back the Wild with Kyle Armstrong and right in the middle we are joined again by one of my very favorite educators in the world, Daphne, joining us at OceanWise. OceanWise is the single best organization on planet Earth for sharing resources and info about the oceans. If you're interested in plastic pollution, animals, climate change, more, go to ocean.org and find out so, so much more about it. I really encourage you to do that when you're done the broadcast. Before I turn it over to Daphne to talk about our topic, I will note we have a Kahoot today. So if you want to join along with a little four question quiz between our talk and Q&A, head to Kahoot.it, put in this game pin. I will share this again throughout the program. Nice little opportunity to be extra engaging. YouTubers, keep your fingers on the keyboard. We are gonna have lots of interactivity today. Our five classes live with us. Keep those mics on. We're gonna have lots of interactivity today. But without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Daphne. We are talking today about adaptations for surviving in the oceans, one of my very favorite topics. Daphne, so nice to see you again. Take us away. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me again, Jesse. It's always a wonderful time to connect with you and all of the wonderful classes joining us today. Uh, I am actually joining you all from Vancouver, BC, Canada. So I'm over along the west coast of Canada on the Pacific Ocean, right in Vancouver. Now, that does mean that I am actually visiting you virtually from the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Peoples. And I'm extremely grateful that I'm able to live, learn, play, and connect with you all from these lands. And I want us to take a moment to think about the land that we live on. Whose land might that be? Do you know? If you don't know, maybe you should take a moment to figure out whose land you are on. There are many opportunities for you to find that out on websites like Whose Land, uh, as well as many others. This helps us learn more about how we can better respect the people in the land that we are on and protect it as they have since time immemorial. But today, I want to introduce you to some amazing ocean things, but really, myself, Daphne, I am an educator with OceanWise, and we love to do amazing things for the ocean. Give us a thumbs up in your classroom if uh, you love the ocean as well. We at OceanWise, we are trying to help protect the ocean through things like reducing ocean pollution around plastics and noise, reducing overfishing, as well as finding ways to help fight climate change. There's lots that all of us can do, and I'd love to see in the chat, or maybe we can get uh, an idea shared or two, what do you think you can do to help protect the ocean? Ooh, so we've got Miss Lee's class, Miss Smith's class on YouTube, our five classes live with us. You guys want to chime in the chat? We'd love to hear from you what you think you can do for the ocean. Miss Gertzen's class, I'm going to add to you guys live fourth graders, see if you have a thought for us. What can we do for the ocean together? Hey, come in. Um, recycle as much as you can. Nice. Recycle as much as you can. Miss Mustard's class, I'm going to head to you guys for a quick second. I will come to everyone, I promise, throughout the course of the broadcast lot for interactivity. Four fives. What do we think? What can we do? Um, stop littering. Stop littering. Recycle. These are two great options. Okay, I promise I'm coming to everyone later on throughout the program, but that's a great start, Daphne. <laughs> Amazing. There's lots we can do. Yes, we can stop littering. We can recycle. I like to think of recycling as being the last of the three. So if we think of reducing, reusing, and recycling, I like to think of those in that order. So recycling is great if we can't do those other two. But we at OceanWise, we are a 
a nonprofit organization whose mission is to empower communities and individuals like yourself to take action to protect and restore our world's ocean. And that means that I will share some other ways we can help protect the ocean later on. But I would love for us to dive into the ocean right now for some adaptations for surviving the ocean with a little bit of a touch on energy for this Science Literacy Week. The first thing I just want us to think about is all of the amazing life that we see in the ocean. I'll give you a moment if you're in class or if you're at home to share your favorite animal or maybe a few animals you can think of that live in the ocean. I'll give us 10 seconds. Leafy sea dragon, leafy sea dragon, the coolest animal ever. Just saying. <laughs> there are some amazing animals and yes, a leafy sea dragon is beautiful. Great adaptations for camouflage. But we're gonna talk about some different adaptations that we see in these animals today. If you don't know what adaptations means, that's okay. It's a way for living things to help them survive. So if we take a look at the animals I have here, we have some sea urchins and sea stars. We have uh, some jellyfish. We have a crab and, some, and a shark. What are some way things or body parts, maybe behaviors that help these animals survive? I'll give us another 10 seconds to brainstorm Ooh. or to think about some ideas. Hmm, what do we got? We've got, by the way, Daphne, our chat crews are doing amazingly on YouTube. So Ms. Lee, Ms. Smith's class, you guys are awesome on YouTube. Uh, live classes, feel free to share in StreamYard as well, but take a think on it for now. We'll go to you, I promise, for more curies soon. I love it. Well, some of the ones that I'm used to hearing are things like, uh, if we have jellyfish, maybe they ha can sting you to help protect themselves. Maybe if they're a crab, they've got pinchers. If you want, you can show me your pinchers as well. Always. Oh, fins, thick skin, gills, teeth. Yeah. Yes. Those are all great adaptations. So I have a bit of a question for you. The ocean is the largest habitat on the planet. What do you think? Are there lots of animals with lots of different adaptations in the ocean? Is this true or false? The ocean, the largest habitat on the planet. I'm going to head to Ms. Gomar's class too. Oh, unless, are, are, am I good to go to a class? Is that I was just going to say we can vote with our thumbs up for true or thumbs down for false. What do we think, Ms. Gomar's group? True or false? True. We got thumbs up galore. Thumbs up galore. All the thumbs. True on YouTube. Everyone says true. Nice. This is true. It is huge. And that allows for lots of different adaptations and diversity through these animals. So adaptations are changes that help a species better, become better suited to its environment. Do you think that that is true or false? Miss mm, Gagne's class, true or false? Yell it out. True. 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 I love it. Yes, this is true. So really it's helping them to survive. So I have a bit of a question here for you. Which of these options is not an adaptation? What do we think? You can give me numbers on your fingers if you want. I'll go one for fur, two for blubber, three for mouth, four for shivering. What do you think? Oh, I see a hand in Ms. Gertzen's class. Ms. H's class, do you guys have a thought? Grade twos? What do you think, friends? Fur. Fur is not an adaptation. Fur? That's what we're saying. Okay, Ms. Gertzen's class. Oh, there's so many hands up in, in Kansas. What do we think? One. Well, I think most of the fingers one. I see are ones. One. Okay. We're Interesting. All right. Well, fur. you know what? Some of you may not have had me for any Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants programs before, but I am known to do some trick questions. Uh, oh. So great guesses, everyone. But really, all of these are adaptations. And we'll explore a few of them throughout the program today. But yes, anything from fur to teeth to blubber to even shivering to stay warm are ways to help us survive. I want to take a look at a few animals to help us dive into these adaptations and maybe how they can 
how animals can save energy to help them stay alive. So I have three animals here and we're going to explore some of the ways that they save energy. We have, you can say it out loud in class if you want with me, we have a sea otter with its fur. We have a bluefin tuna, a bluefin tuna with heat acclimatization. Pretty much they can stay warm maybe. And then we have a seal, seal with some blubber. I'm going to let us vote with our fingers. I'm going to have us do one for sea otter, two for tuna, three for seal. I'm going to let you choose the order we explore. Oh, I might go rogue here and bring in all the classes to yell this out and see what we think. Because it's going to be one of three. We are going to cover them all, I promise. But all our classes, I'm going to put you guys in. What do we think? Seal, tuna, or sea otter? Okay. Crazy. Fur, I think, first. Sea otter is our kickoff creature du jour. Amazing. I love it. I love all the enthusiasm. All right. Well, if we dive into this wonderful animal, the sea otter, the first thing I think of is all of that cute, fuzzy fur that it has on its body. Now, they have a lot of fur. And just like many other animals, that fur is found on lots of mammals and it keeps them warm by trapping a layer of warm air near their skin. So if you think of your hair on your head, it's going to actually help keep your head warm. I'm sure if you know anyone with a, a bald head, they're going to need to wear a hat to stay warm. They don't have any hair to help them. But we have animals such as polar bears and arctic foxes also having that fur to keep them warm. But sea otters are my favorite. Now, if you have not had an opportunity to actually feel sea otter fur before, I will explore it for you. I'll touch it and I'll let you know. I have some fur that was donated to us at, that is from a sea otter. We did not harm the animal. We're just, we just have part of it to learn more. But if you take a look, you can see it's super, hopefully you can see this, it's super, super fluffy and soft almost like a stuffy or a stuffed animal. Now, if we explore this a little bit more, I have a big question for you. True or false, sea otters have the densest fur in the animal kingdom. So that means this fur that I have is going to have the most hairs per square inch or square centimeter. So imagine if I put my finger on top of this fur, there's the most number of hairs underneath my finger of any animal. Do you think that is true or false? Thumbs up Ms. for Ms. Ms. English class, what do we think? False. Ooh, one class is each. False and true. I like it. Uh, anyone on YouTube? I like, by the way, the number of hands in Ms. Gertzen's class for every single thing is amazing. Ms. Lee's class on YouTube says true. Okay, what, I don't know, Daphne, what is it? Well, we might think of a polar bear or an Arctic fox having really long, thick fur, but you know what? Sea otters are actually gonna be the densest fur. And this means that if I take, uh, on our head, we're gonna have around 100,000 hairs, I believe, around that. If we take my finger and put it on top of the sea otter's fur, we have about the same amount of hairs on our head under just the tip of my finger. So in about a square centimeter, we have about 100,000 hairs. So much so that if I am trying to part the fur on the sea otter, it's gonna be almost impossible for me to actually find the skin. There's so much fur. Now what this means is they can actually stay super, super warm, but there's something else. Where do we see sea otters? What kind of environment? Hmm. What do you think? Trop the tropics, Caribbean? No, that doesn't seem right. Miss Gawney's class, what do we think? Where do we see sea otters? Do you know? Alaska. 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 Wow, very, very good. Definitely. We see sea otters from Alaska, 
all the way down into California. We see them along uh, Vancouver Island, sometimes maybe the coast of uh, British Columbia here in Canada. But we're going to see them usually in cold water and on the water. They rarely come on land. That means they need to stay super, super warm and dry. Their fur being so dense actually traps tons of air in there. And that actually creates a barrier, almost like a dry suit to keep them super, super warm. And you can see, actually, you can let me know with your fingers. How many sea otters do we see in this photo? Hmm. One big one. Yeah, there's that's, definitely that's a big my, one. Yeah, maybe there's some, uh, uh, I don't know. We got a lot. We got some twos. This reminds me of Shrek. Two, two, my lord, three. I don't know. Uh, well, yeah. We are going to be seeing a nice big mother sea otter here. And some of them are going to get up to five, maybe even six feet long, almost the size of a human. So some of them are pretty big. But we've got a really cute little baby here. We've got the head and then that super fuzzy body. And my thing about sea otters is that when they're a baby, their fur is so dense and trapped so much air, it acts like a life jacket and they actually can't go underwater. They actually need to lose that lanugo or baby fur before they can learn to swim. I think that's really cute. So if they have all of this fur to keep them warm, do they also have a layer of blubber or fat to keep them warm? So do sea otters have lots of fat to keep them warm? True or false? This Comar's class, grade sevens. What do you think? Oh, oh. Oh. There was like slight hesitation and then they all came on board with false. I love it. <laughs> well, you are correct. They actually aren't going to have all that same fat that many other animals have. Instead, they're going to use tons of energy to fluff that fur all the time and eat a lot to make sure they have energy for that. But this fur is really helping them save energy by not having to store so much fat on their body. Now, I think that this fur is absolutely amazing. It's waterproof, but that means they need to be really cute and they need to fluff their fur to stay warm. So maybe I'm gonna show you a video of some sea otters fluffing their fur, but maybe you can pretend that you're a sea otter while we watch. So we got to explore a little bit about fur and how it's going to trap that heat, uh, keep these animals warm. That helps the sea otter save energy. What animal would we like to explore next? Ooh, I'm going to pick at random. Miss Mustard's class, what do we think? Seal or tuna? We've caused a rift. Oh, I'm so sorry. Daphne, save us. Pick one. <laughs> uh, let's go with tuna this time. All right. And I think tuna are one of the most beautiful fish that we see in the ocean. And they are absolutely amazing. They're also a bit delicious, and we'll talk about that being a bit of a problem in a moment. But my first question is, tuna are amazing, they're beautiful, they are fast. How fast are they? Got some, I've got some guesses here. We've got 40 kilometers an hour or 25 miles per hour, 62 kilometers an hour or 38 miles per hour, 70 kilometers per hour, 43 miles per hour, or 100 kilometers an hour. 62 miles per hour. Wow. What do we think, everyone? With school zone speeds up to highway speeds. Okay, I'm going to yep. go Miss Gertzen's class. It's been a bit. Fourth graders, what do we think? It can go faster. Show me your fingers. It's what do you think? Fast. It can go faster. A I bunch of trees. Okay, I knew it. I like we're getting closer to the camera. Three. Okay, so 70 kilometers seems to be our, our go-to. Okay. Well, you know what? You are all super, super smart. It is 70 kilometers per hour or 43 miles per hour. And that is fast. That is really fast. If you can imagine being in a car, that's kind of on like a, a faster street, not quite a highway, uh, but getting up there. These are fast fish. And one of the other amazing things that I'd love to share with you 
It's one of the things I think is really amazing. If you take a look at this tuna and you take a look at how big its body is and then how teeny weeny its um, body is right when it connects to its tail, we see this in many of the fastest fish in the ocean that how skinny that, if you have really skinny connection between their tail and their body, that may be an indication that they are a really fast fish. So maybe you know of another fish that looks similar. All right, but I have another question for you. Tuna, are they cold-blooded like other fish? True or false? Hmm, I'm gonna head uh, Miss H's class, grade twos. What do we think, true or false? Let's see. Go ahead, say it, true? True! Oh, we think they are. All of the other fish are cold-blooded and so are our tuna. It's not a trap at all. Right. Oh, I, I would never put a trap question out there. What? Never, never. <laughs> well, it's a great guess and you would think all fish are gonna be cold-blooded. They're gonna be similar temperature to what's around them. But these fish are swimming so fast, they actually have an adaptation that helps them stay kind of warm-blooded. They can keep their body at a temperature above the water around them. This has a big fancy name. It's called regional endothermy. Endothermy just meaning that they can keep heat in. And really this, the way they do this is by not just having blood flow from their gills through their body back to their gills, but it almost has an extra loop. And this extra loop, as we can kind of see here, means that they can actually transfer that warm blood that went through their muscles, creating all this energy, all that energy from that muscle activity. Maybe you can swim really fast with me. If we're like wiggling really, really fast like a fish, we're gonna get really warm. That warmth is gonna transfer to our blood. Normally that blood would then go to the gills. It'd get cold again. These tuna, their adaptation means that that warm blood actually passes by some colder blood coming from the gills, keeping that warm that warmth closer to their internal body. It's always gonna be colder blood towards the outside of their body, warmer towards the inside. You can kind of think of it as if I have, say I have my crab and this is kind of warmer uh, towards the in inside of their body. They're gonna kind of have, uh, I have kind of like a porpoise here. Uh, it's blue, it's kind of colder. If I just have them just going in one direction from in to out, in to out, gonna get cold blood towards the inside of my body. But if I have an extra loop, I'm going to actually have a, a way for this cold or this warm blood from the inside of my body to transfer that warmth to the cold blood coming in, meaning I can keep my warm blood inside and I'm gonna have cold blood towards the outside. Pretty much an extra loop means they are going to have warmer blood towards their insides. All right, I know that's confusing, but let's carry on. Because you know what? Bluefin tuna in particular is very sought after because it's so delicious and hard. there are less of them around. How much do you think uh, a bluefin has sold for? It's the most amount of money a bluefin tuna has ever been purchased for $125,000, $275,000, $1.8 dollars or $3.1 million. Get out of here, Daphne. There's no way. And also the, the, the how linked this is to the Kahoot is quite comical. Um, let's head into Connie's class. What do you guys think? Surely not. Three. Somewhere between 275k and 1.8 million, which by the way, no matter what, is all ridiculous for one fish. It's absurd. It, it yeah. is. And you know what? It was for a long time 1.8 million dollars. But in I believe 2019, one sold for 3.1 million dollars. It weighed about 600, it weighed over 600 pounds or around 275 kilograms and was sold to a Japanese sushi restaurant owner. Usually tuna is valued around like 400 
to almost $5,000 per pound. That is expensive. And this means that that holds a huge value for these fish. Even if we're trying to protect them, it can make it hard to do that because people want to catch them to sell them for so much money. I mean, who wouldn't like a little extra pocket change? All right, but let's find out a little bit more. In the Pacific, uh, the stock population is about 3%. Oh, sorry, friends. What we, we say virgin stock population. Come on. There we go. Most of the original abundance of fish, so 3% of uh, what was once there, so it's not in good shape at all. Now, I will say, Yes, it has gone down so much, but there is hope because recently in the last few years, we've actually started to see a small increase in some of those bluefin tuna populations. Hopefully regulations can outweigh that price that that tuna holds and we can continue seeing a bit of an increase because those populations are small right now. All right, we have one last animal to explore and that is those cute seals. And seals have this amazing adaptation. Yes, they have some fur. Maybe you're surprised by that. But this fur isn't going to keep them very warm. It's actually very waxy. It's not super dense. It's more to help keep the water off their body. And then they're going to have that layer of blubber. And that's going to be that special fat that keeps them super, super warm. Now, if you can take a look at me and give me a thumbs up, if you see that thumbs up, if you're an Arctic seal, that's about how much blubber you're gonna have on your body. So if you take that thumbs up and stick it out from your belly, that's about where your skin would be. You'd have this thick blanket or jacket of blubber all around you to keep you warm. Now, big question. It's not just seals that have blubber. Which of these animals does not have blubber? Ooh. What do you think? Fish, seals, whales, or walruses. Miss Mustard's class, lots of hands there. What do we think? Fish. Oh, one seals, but mainly fish. We are correct. Nice. Whales, seals, walruses, many marine mammals that live in colder environments are going to have lots of blubber. Fish. They don't, they're gonna be cold blooded and they just kind of stay the similar temperature to what's around them. Unlike those tuna and some other animals as well. There are some sharks uh, and other uh, fish that can kind of regulate their body temperature like that tuna. But these seals are super cute and I think that blubber makes them even cuter. They're gonna have that nice round body to keep them super, super warm and they may even try and absorb some extra sunlight to heat them up as well. Who doesn't like to sunbathe just like some seals? So we have seen fur to help save energy. We've seen uh, saving energy by having kind of extra loops in our blood flow to keep at warmth towards our core. We've even seen blubber to insulate seals and other animals like a big jacket. But my friends, how can we help these animals? What do you think? I'll get maybe two suggestions. What do you think we could do to help protect these animals in their environment? Miss mm, Komar's class, I'm going to add to grade seven. Uh, YouTubers are looking for your answers as well. And soon we're going to our Kahoot as well, which is exciting. So lots more opportunity in just a minute. But grade sevens, any thoughts? What can we do to help these animals? Stop overfishing. Stop overfishing. That's one. Any other thoughts? No. Don't eat them. Don't eat them? Okay. No, honestly, same idea. Don't overfish. It's a great option. Uh, let's see. We got classes out. Miss Gandhi's class. What do we think? What do you guys think? Don't eat them. Don't eat them. I like this. We've got litter and plastic, and we've got don't overfish. These are both great options, Daphne. They really are. And pollution can really negatively affect animals in the ocean. So making sure yours doesn't get on the ground. Yeah, reducing our use of plastic as well. That's a great way to help. Maybe even doing something like an ocean-wide shoreline cleanup to help collect safely litter that you see in your environment. Or something like choosing not to eat seafood. 
Or if you like to eat seafood, choosing more sustainable options as well. That can look like looking for a symbol such as the Oceanwise recommended seafood label. There are many other uh, groups that do this as well uh, in the States and other countries, but check out your local seafood counter or seafood products for a sustainability logo. This can make sure that you and your family can choose a smarter choice for the ocean. So things like look for those seafood logos, buying local as well. So there's less uh, carbon emissions going into the atmosphere, getting your food to you or items that you love. And educating others are great ways to help protect these animals and all of them in the ocean. So I'd like to say thank you so much. I'm excited for this Kahoot as well. And take it over, Jesse. Thank you so much. And uh, any of our classes that want to check out the animal quiz, this will be on our screen. If you want to watch our YouTube video, you can scan the QR code then and bring that up. Um, but as you said, I'm going to dive with our code. Daphne and I did not coordinate this before the broadcast. She's like, here are the animals I'm talking about. Uh, we think very similarly. Uh, classes, if you want to pull up the game pin 5433478, the faster you answer, the more points you get with the Kahoot, and you don't win anything, but you do win Daphne and I's everlasting respect. We've given out a lot of respect over the years, so this is your moment. Um, we're going to do this four quick questions, and then I'm coming to all our live classes and our amazing YouTube classes for some questions. Probably going to get in one per group, uh, so stick around, stay tuned for all that. And uh, I'm going to give you guys just a second to get in with our Kahoot. I encourage all our classes to check out ocean.org. So many resources if you want to keep the learning going, whether it's sustainable seafood, plastic, climate, everything, it is all there for you to discover. All right, with that, with my computer lagging, with the amount of internet that's going on, with so many things happening right now, I hope I'm still audibly good. Um, I'm going to kick us off. Let's start with our first question. Daphne, you can give us hints at the end of every question, but you did give us hints in a lot of your questions during the broadcast already. I love it. It's going to be a great review. Here we go. OceanWise applications. Three, two, one. Get the question to answers in as fast as you can, especially if you're on YouTube. 20 seconds each. Sea otters have the thickest fur of any mammal. True or false? We covered explicitly this. Where are you listening? Over 40 answers. Way to go. All right. They're coming in. They're coming in. 10 more seconds. It's not us. Thick and luscious as Daphne's hair and I are have good grammar. <laughs> I'm so glad I'm in science. 66 answers, way to go. So many of you. True, yes, they do. A million hairs per square, which is ridiculous. It's hard to even fathom. Fuzzy gliders got our lead. Okay, we are going to go to question two. Uh, all about, we've got one for each animal plus a bonus one. Seals and sea lions are most related to. I did, did not know this. Is it whales, bears, manatees, or sharks? I This is my, I, I got to be like you. We're going to trip up a lot of people, I think. And it's enjoyable. So this is going to be the <laughs> devastation in the, the leaderboard. 75 of you, so many of you. Okay. The answer is bears, which is totally, and oh, almost the lowest. Yes, just because whales and manatees are in the water. Seals are carnivores. They're in the same group as otters, as weasels, as bears, as dogs. It's wild. And then sharks are fish. So a totally different group. Oh, leaderboard's going to go mad. I'm so excited. Yes, totally. Amazon Badger takes our lead. Let's go to question number three, which I think we also explicitly covered. In fact, one of them, you went a little bolder. Yeah, Bluefin Tuna can go for how much at auction? What are the chances? Is it 100 bucks, 1,000 bucks, 10,000 bucks, or over 100,000 bucks? Made this before I knew where you're going to go. Very exciting. Who's paying attention? In fact, it's, uh, you know, we'll say it. It's like way more. It's crazy. It's not even on the chart. We're like in a whole different chart. 94 of you in now, which is awesome. Yes, $3.1 million for a fish. That's crazy. I wouldn't spend that much in a fish. It doesn't really matter how good a fish it was. We had some tuna in the, the ocean right near me and grows more in Newfoundland not too long ago. It's very exciting. All right. We talked about the fact that we need all these adaptations to survive all the habitats in the ocean. What percentage of the world's livable habitats, places where creatures can exist on this planet, are in the oceans? Is it 1%, 10%, 50%, or over 95%? Hint, we've been going big with a lot of our answers. Perhaps that's a trend you might want to follow along with. And indeed, yes, it's so absurd. I mean, land surface is, first of all, 70% of the world's surface is ocean. 
So way more of the surface of the earth is ocean than land. And then oceans are deep. So there's so many habitats within oceans for creatures to live. So much need for incredible adaptations to survive those varying habitats. Silly Raven the third, Daring Impala in second. If you're any of these people, let us know who you are. First place, brah, drum roll, please, goes to Amazon Badger. Very different from our, our ocean theme, but that's fine. Uh, we uh, thank you very much for participating in that. And we are going to go on to our Q&A now. I'm going to head to Miss Gertzen's class first. I'm coming to all our live groups. YouTubers, please do share a question as well. Uh, but let's head Here. to Beaver, Kansas to kick ourselves off. Hi. Marshall. Please come in. Hi. Hi. No, 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 Marshall. Hi. Hey, 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 I would say, this sounds kind of weird, but I'd say all of the really good questions that I get asked. I love getting stumped by questions from other people and being able to connect with people and learn from them. So that's my favorite part of my job is being able to connect with people just like you. And maybe I'll even learn something new from them. That's a beautiful answer. Thank you, Daphne. Uh, Miss Comar's class, grade sevens, welcome in. Uh, and if you have a question for us, take us away. <laughs> oh, I, oh, is, is Blubber edible? <laughs> is Blubber edible? I like that. We've never had that one before. <laughs> Great question. Yes, it is very edible. And it's a really uh, big part of many indigenous cultures up in the Arctic, so many Inuit cultures within Canada and other countries, it is a staple within diet. Uh, in some areas, such as um, up in northern Canada, it would be known as muktuk, uh, which would be what you know beluga blubber and others might be called. So, yes, it is very nutritious, super oily, uh, and yeah, definitely edible. Great. Question, guys. All right, we're going to go from St. Uh, Martin to Northeast Hope. Uh, Miss H's class, grade twos, come on in. And if you have a question for Daphne, you are in the broadcast. It wants to let you in. It's thinking about it. There we are. Hi. <laughs> Do all jellyfish dig? Ooh, great question. I love this one. Yes, they all sting. They all have these little cells that are trying to kind of grab you. They have no hands. They just have little hooks that they kind of try and grab their food or uh, predators with. Now, what hurts is the uh, toxin that they actually put in with those hooks. So some are gonna be more toxic than others and it's gonna hurt more. Some, you may not even realize that it's, um, that it's got you because that toxin isn't enough to hurt you or you've touched with the thick skin of your fingers and it hasn't actually gone all the way through to your bloodstream. So yes, you're all gonna, they're all gonna get you, just maybe not as much as others. Yeah, there are places in the world where you can swim with jellyfish and they're all around you and you're totally fine, but it's just not enough to really affect you. And there's certain jellyfish that can kill people actually, which is quite, you know, uh, a dangerous scenario and one that lifeguards and countries around the world try and make sure people aren't having interactions with those specific kinds of jelly. So great query, guys. Miss Mustard, Miss Ganya, I'm coming to you in two quick seconds. I'm going to take our YouTube ones really fast and then I'll be right with you. Faria in Miss Lee's class wants to know, oh, I like this one very much. I'm going to bring it up on screen. Uh, if octopus have multiple hearts and why do they have this adaptation? Great question. Yes, they do have multiple hearts. They have three hearts. They have one just like ours that pumps blood all around the body. And then they have two others that pump blood just to each of their gills. So I would say that they're going to have this because oxygen's really important and you really want to make sure that you're getting oxygen to those gills uh, or that you're getting blood to those gills to absorb lots of oxygen. Uh, we have different chambers in our heart to make sure that we're getting blood to our, uh, our lungs and then getting it back out to the rest of our body. Yep. Our heart does more work. Theirs is just going to be separated into multiple. 
Fantastic. We are going to head to Illinois now, Miss Smith's class. I know we got another Illinois live with us. We got a lot of Illinois. You guys are great. Um, let's see. Are fish that live deep in the ocean safe from plastic? Or, or great, question. great question. Great question. We see plastic all over the ocean. Unfortunately, we do see it in the deepest parts of the ocean as well. And that can be bigger pieces like plastic bags or plastic water bottles, but also lots of teeny tiny microplastics that once were part of a big item, but they've broken up and are much harder to clean up from the ocean. So plastic is everywhere, unfortunately. That's where our solutions like reducing our plastic use, maybe even picking up our litter, great for the ocean. It is. We've been having a lot of marine plastic programs this month. So if you want to head to our YouTube channel, all of those are there. Imogen Napper came on, Taylor Madeline, some really spectacular programs. We've got some more in the month to come as well. All right, I'm going to head to Brampton, best food in Canada. Uh, Miss Mustard's class, welcome in, guys, and uh, take us away. Hey. <laughs> um, Which uh, sea animal produces the most uh, babies? <laughs> oh, that's a great question. I actually don't know the answer, but I would say it would be a type of animal that broadcast spawns. So yes. instead of having a few babies that are already pretty developed and look similar to an adult, they're going to be either like little larvae that they send out thousands or even maybe hundreds of thousands into the water and hope that a few survive. So that could be things like jellyfish, um, corals, sponges, many animals are broadcast spawners. Great I'm question. Gonna, I'd love for somebody to look that up. That's a great question. I'll try and find it on Google before we wrap up. Um, but I will note all our classes, if you take nothing else away, I mean, Daphne's been amazing. There's so many things. Coral spawning. Everyone needs to go and watch a coral spawning video when you're done. It will change your life. It's like fireworks underwater. It is such a cool thing to witness and a perfect example of that broadcast spawning that we're talking about. So great question, Miss Mustard class. All right. We're going to head to Ms. Gandhi's class. Welcome in uh, to wrap us up with one final question. I know we're, time flies and you're having fun, but come on in. Um, My question is, we have, like, we were talking about fall to keep them warm in the ocean, but seagulls, when they float to catch the fish, how do they stay warm and how do they float? Ooh. Great question. So they are going to have, instead of fur, they're going to have, uh, feathers and that down layer, that really fluffy layer underneath those bigger feathers we're used to seeing. So they have feathers acting just like fur, being really fuzzy, trapping air to keep them warm. Great question. Daphne, speaking of questions, and I'm sorry to do this live with you in a broadcast, are you willing to take a Padlet with some extra questions after the fact? I know you've done that with us before. Okay, you have time. So classes, yeah. we'd love to take more questions in a live broadcast. We know some of you have to go to lunch or end your day, so we can't take as many as we like live. I will get you a link if you register for today's program right when we're done this in an hour when I finish my next show. Uh, if you have any additional questions, you'll be able to share them there. We'll leave that up for two days and Daphne and I will help answer all those questions. So please do keep any questions you have, write them down, give them to your teacher and we can get those on the Padlet when we're done. Daphne, this has been so much fun as always. I want to stress uh, for anything, there's a true statement, ocean.org has everything. Plastics, sustainable seafood, climate, everything. There's so much going on. OceanWise is an amazing organization doing incredible work to educate kids like you and the general public about every issue associated with the ocean and what you can do to help. Um, this is our first of many programs we're going to be doing with Daphne. And again, our YouTube channel has a gazillion. So if you want to check out anything we've ever done in the past, it's all right there. Um, Daphne, before we bring in all our kids to say a big thank you and farewell, is there any last message about adaptations you want to leave them with today? I would just say that the planet is changing really quickly and adaptations take a really long time to develop or for an animal to get those. So the more that we can help animals and the ocean to fix, you know, or challenge climate change and find solutions, the better off all those animals are going to be because adapting takes a long time. It's Thanks sure. for joining me, everyone. Thank you, Daphne. And as you well know, and for our classes, this might be your first time, I'm going to bring in all our classes to say a big thank you and farewell. Really appreciate you joining us. Stay tuned for that email when you're done. But Ms. Comar's class, Ms. Gertzen's class, Ms. H's class, Ms. Mustard's class, Ms. Connie's class, I'm bringing you all in as soon as my buttons will allow me to do so. Bye, everyone. Nice job. Such a pleasure.